What's up? This is Seth Mosley. Welcome to the Made It in Music podcast. And today we've got a good one. We've got Don Donahue of Streamline Event Agency, who is bringing an entirely new model to musicians, to the music business in a way that you can monetize and expand your reach in a way you probably have never thought of before. So this is going to be a really, really good episode for you. But before we dive in and before I introduce Don, I just wanted to quickly let you know that the Full Circle Music team is always looking for interns. We want to provide as much value and experience as possible to those interested in pursuing a career in the music industry. So if you want to be a part of an award-winning team where you're working on high-level projects, we'd love to have you apply. If this sounds like something you could benefit from, head over to fullcirclemusic.com slash intern to submit your application. So again, that's fullcirclemusic.com slash intern intern. All right, so let is, let's jump into this conversation with the one and only Don Donahue. Don, thanks so much for being here today. Seth, thank you. And I'm wondering if I can apply to be an intern. Do I qualify? I think you would be a bit overqualified there, my friend. Uh, I hear that a lot <laughs> these days. I think that just means I'm getting older. <laughs> I love it. Hey, and, and before we jump in, I just wanted to let you know. Um, so uh, for, for, for those who don't realize, you know, your, your background is is having worked on the label side, and I'm going to ask a little bit about that, but you you oversaw a label called Rocket Town Records, which uh, was with uh, Michael W. Smith, the artist, and there was a label under Rocket Town called RKT Records. And wow. my my first label meeting in Nashville, like as an artist, like coming down and meeting with the, the agent, the A&R guy, was with John Andrade at... RKT Records. It was at the Moe's Burritos in Brentwood. And that was my, like, we connected on MySpace. I think he sent me a MySpace message back in my artist days. And so that sort of opened up my mind to this whole, oh, wow, these, there's labels, there's not, there's publishers, there's all this stuff. So, but that was RKT Records was my first that label meeting. That is just uh, a blast from the past. I, I, I can't say that I forgot about RKT Records, but to show you the success we had with it, uh, probably the fact that we didn't sign you means it didn't take off very well. So um, John is a, is a great guy, was a, is still is a great guy and a great family man. And I think that's a cool story to have. But yeah, we had, we had a couple. We wanted to do a rock label because we were such a singer-songwriter label. And um, we rebranded and we put out a few things on that. And, and that was kind of right towards the end of the wind down, but that was a cool chapter. Yeah, absolutely. Some great artists on, on, on rocket town and even RKT side. I, I was, I was a big fan of some, some of the artists at the time. So I want to back even before that, what first inspired you personally to jump into music? Um, I was raised in Columbia, Missouri, which is a dot on the map, 120 miles each way between St. Louis and Kansas City. So to go to any concerts, I had to go that far. And I became uh, I became a Christian later in life at, at 17, 18 years old. And when, when, when that happens, all of your well-meaning new Christian friends want to replace all of your evil secular music like Phil Collins and Journey with Christian music. And everything they played me was awful and it's just like <laughs> what did i sign up for like this is not cool you know and so i was a big music kid grew up uh, on some classic singer songwriters elton john james taylor billy joel just that was my that was my wheelhouse and and i went to st louis and i saw michael w smith's big picture tour in 1986 and what i didn't know then but what i got to know years later was the value that they put on not only the production of music and the message of the music, but the production on stage. And in the year too young to remember this, but there used to be a time when stage lights didn't move. <laughs> they just were cans that pointed at the center of the stage and that was lighting. But, but, but the big picture tour and Michael uh, and, and, and subsequently his management and touring company, Blanton Harrell, invested a ton in the product to make it look great. So that was the first thing that I saw that I went, wow, this is really great. And I kind of became a little bit of a, 
of a chaser of Smitty and went to see some tours and, you know, just got to know some of the people there and ended up promoting one of his shows at my university in, in Columbia, Missouri. I, I'd love to put it just, just park right there for a second. Can you take me back to that? What, what did you mean at the time they had invested so much into the product? Like were, were they doing things production wise that were unheard of at the time? Like what, what do you mean specifically by that? Well, it sounds funny now, especially probably to your audience who's younger than I am, but they had, uh, it was the Fox Theater in St. Louis, which is a, it's a classic old theater. It's probably a 2,500, 3,000 seat place. And the width of the stage at the beginning of the show was covered with a replication of the album cover. I mean, it was probably a hundred feet wide by 50 feet deep. And that's what the scrim was. And the music starts and they're obviously behind that. And in kind of one fell swoop, that curtain slid in one motion and all of these very lights just hit the piano where Smitty was to kind of start the show. And just that, I remember that motion going, how, <laughs> how did all that just happen? Like, like choreographically, how did all that happen? How did that thing slide? How did those lights move? That was a new move for me. And I just remember thinking in that moment, I want to be a part of something this cool. It's a great message. It's not cheesy. This everybody on stage looks like stars. You know, it's it's wardrobed well. It's it's the but, but it starts with the music and the music was fantastic and compelling. So that's kind of what put me on the quest to go, I want to work with that. Then naively enough at 20 years old, I just went back to my home and called the whatever name was in the back of the uh, probably cassette J card. I called Reunion Records in Nashville and they said, you need to call this company in New York to book a show. And I, I did and called a booking agency and, and brought Michael to town about six months later. Never had promoted a show, put on a tie one morning, went to the Christian bookstore and the Christian radio station and asked for funding and they funded me. That's Amazing. I love that. <laughs> well, and, and I, the reason why I ask that is just because we talk so much at Full Circle Music and on the podcast, just how much it takes to break the career of a new artist. It really requires a, and it doesn't matter who's doing it. Somebody has to invest pretty heavily on the front end to create yeah. something that's different. Um, even more so nowadays, everybody's seen the moving lights. Everybody's seen the risers that go up and down on stage. Everybody's you know, you go out and see a Drake show and there's a big giant hundred foot globe and like it's, it's getting harder and harder to outdo each other in terms of production. I mean, you go to, yeah, so the point show. to where was it, was it, was it Travis last year that put a roller coaster in the audience? It's like, okay, we're, we're kind of, we're maybe, maybe jumping the shark a little bit with what we can do inside of four walls, <laughs> inside of four walls. So that, and that's, and that's why I think what y'all are doing is, is cutting edge. It's kind of stripping that back a little bit and we'll, we'll get there um, yeah. shortly in the conversation. But I think just seeing, you know, some of the stuff that's, that's going on, you know, Travis Scott setting a world record for, biggest attended event that was on, on, um, uh, what's the game that everybody plays the, the game, the, the big, oh, um, uh, Minecraft or what, whatever the, whatever, one of those games, Fortnite. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Biggest 12 million people on it. And so that's the new version of that, but I'm sure there was some pretty heavy investment that went in behind the scenes one way or the other. So the takeaway there is, man, if you want to stand out, you've got to invest heavily. Well, and the other takeaway is sometimes something artistically happens to you that wakes you up that you know you want to be a part of. And that can be a melody line, it can be a lyric, or it can be a curtain and a light show moving instantaneously that makes you go, how did that happen? Who's, who's behind that? And I, I had a marketing director one time that had a great line that I told him I was going to steal, and I always have. He had a line that he used that said, I can't, therefore I help. Uh, I'm not overly musically inclined, but I want to help the people that are. I am passionate to stand just to the side of the stage and watch my artist communicate to an audience, but I don't have what it takes to go stand on the stage and communicate to an audience musically. 
I love that. I can't, therefore I help. That's such a good, good quote. Um, tell us kind of the next st steps in your career. How, how did your career sort of take off and where, where did it evolve from there? So the, the, the quick version is I got a call after that show in Columbia, Missouri, about a month later from a guy named Scott Huey, um, who's a booking agent. And he and his brother, John Huey, who's now kind of a legendary artist or, or booking agent at CAA, they had their own booking agency in New York that were, was acquired by a bigger booking agency. And they called me and asked me if I wanted to come work for them. And again, I was in hotel and restaurant management, probably making C's and barely getting through college. And I knew I wanted to work with this. They enjoyed working with me, so they offered me a job. And after my junior year at Mizzou, I moved to New York and worked at this company called ICM, International Creative Management, which was one of the big firms at the time. Um, lived in New York for a year. Again, being a relatively new Christian, kind of was like, I don't think this is for me long term, but the value and education I, I learned, I really feel like that was my senior year. So through some of the contacts I met promoting the Smitty show, I came down to Nashville um, and worked management and booking for, a, for a, an artist named Billy Sprague. Uh, Billy was on a label called Reunion Records, which was Michael W.'s label. Um, they, a guy named Michael Blanton hired me to be their first A&R director. So um, I remember I had an interview with Mike. He offered me the job. I had to call a friend in the industry after the interview to find out what the initials A&R meant. <laughs> so again, there's a comment theme here. Don's tripping its way into some of these really <laughs> uh, great opportunities, not fully understanding them. But I worked at Reunion for six years as a, as a talent scout and uh, inherited some unbelievable artists like Michael and Rich Mullins and um, a, a few others. And then I signed a series of new artists and uh, and that was just, it was wonderful learning the ropes with a great, I mean, Reunion was a really legendary label. It was, they were always pushing the envelope. That's when Smitty's first pop hits came out. That's when Amy's Heart in Motion and Baby Baby was coming out and Blanton was her manager. So I was along for that ride as well. But then about five years in, Reunion had been sold about three or four different times because they were hot and the music industry was moving and all these mainstream companies were investing in Christian music, which again was my heart. My heart was way more for how do we take our message into the world than how do we take our message into the church. So it was a fantastic ride. But at some point, it really depersonalized what I signed up for. I signed up for a small independent label run by passionate people that loved each of the artists. And at some point you get, when you're owned by conglomerates, it's all run by who's making money and who's not. So um, by that point, Smitty and I were good friends. We started meeting out on his farm in the mornings and just saying, what if we tried to recreate what Reunion once was? And that was a few people passionate about music, passionate about artists, wanting to change the world and, Let's uh, let's brainstorm what that would look like. It took me a year to talk him into it, but uh, when he made the decision, he made the decision, and we opened Rocket Town Records in June of 1996. So, kind of that's 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 where that was the full circle of concert promotion to management and booking to talent scout to now I'm the president of a record label. What does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's amazing. So you've seen many sides of the music industry of the positions that you've had over the years. What what one do you feel like challenged you the most? Um, Rocket Town had exceptional growth immediately. Um, we we launched in 96. We put out our first record in 97. And probably between 1997 and 2002, um, almost everything we put out worked and worked big. And part of the reason it worked big was because we were really frugal with money. So 
we made Chris Rice's first record, the, the debut record on Rocket Town for twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars, and it sold. And, about, and at the time, that was extremely low. That was extremely low. Yeah, um, budgets were creeping up at the time, and you know, and it, it wasn't nothing, but it was. I would say that. 50, 75, or 100 was probably more the, the norm of what it take to fully produce. But we had an incredible production partner named Monroe Jones. Um, Monroe and Chris kind of came as a package deal. All of us kind of thought, if we go in skinny on this and it works, it's going to be better in the long run. And so we went in skinny and... The 100% of the success of it was Chris's writing. I mean, he came at a time when, you know, ska was big and third day was big and big was big. And, you know, Chris is James Taylor and he wrote unbelievably simple songs that struck a chord and a heart with people. And, you know, each of the first two or three records who put out on him sold 250 to 350,000 units. And, not breaking down all the math, but that's a really good margin. You more they more than recoup your investment at that point. So then Nathan and Christy Knuckles came along because they had heard Chris on the radio and they became Watermark and very similar thing. Monroe produced them. We went in conservatively. They did really well. We did a worship record called Exodus, which was DC Talk, Jars of Clay, um, third day, sixpence, basically all of these hot artists of the day. What does your version of worship music look like? I mean, at, Mark, at Michael's heart, he's a worship leader. So t- that became a Dove Award winning album of the year. Just kind of, it, it just, it was a, it was a ball that was rolling. And so when you asked me what was the most difficult, managing that growth was difficult because at Reunion, Everything I worked on worked pretty well. But at Rocket Town, everything I worked on worked incredibly fast and incredibly well. And the phone starts ringing and people want to do deals with you. And how do you do this and touring? And I had, thankfully, my third employee was an attorney. And it was a lady that put our deal together, uh, our distribution deal together with Word Records, a, a lady named Angie McGill, who's now head of legal for, I believe it's Sony music. So she's super sharp, but she called me shortly after we started and she said, I want to come work with you guys. And I said, well, I can't afford you. And she said, I don't care. And so Angie taking that sacrifice, let me free up my mind on the creative side more because that was going to be the hard part for me, accounting, (laughs) all of the things that it takes to run a business. So that, two th- that that 97 to 2002 3 was probably the most fun that i had it was also the most challenging mm. that's that's so awesome to hear and um man just i always applaud anybody who who can go out on a limb and 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 start and be successful at at, at any music venture on the business side so tell us about how you uh ended up with streamline event agency which is where you're at right now Well, um, there's a few things between that. One is um, this device is the best thing that's ever happened to us. It also took down our record label. (laughs) Um, 2004, 2005, whatever year it came out, the the white one with the wheel, um, I went and I bought it and I plugged it into my computer and for an hour, I just had a blast going and finding all my old music and putting it on there and thinking, you know, I'm a Mac guy, this iPod, this is the greatest thing in the world. And and then I had the, oh crap moment (laughs) because we used to sell CDs for $20. And now this is maybe getting us 99 cents. So uh, it shows you how I'm balanced. I I had a whole lot of fun as an as a uh, as a fan, and then I had a big awakening as a record label president. So, I went on a quest for about five years to try to figure out what's the pivot going to look like. And again, a different podcast story, but we went through a lot of versions of things, including 
long protracted signed negotiations with um, Live Nation to look at creating a faith family version of what, you know, Michael is going to be the face of it. They were doing these 360 deals with Madonna and Jay-Z and all that. So they saw the faith and family side and Rocket Town was going to be. So we go through all of this and it, that took two or three years. And somewhere in the annals of Live Nation, there is a 40 or 50 page signed contract by Michael W. Smith that was not countersigned by Live Nation because they dissolved Live Nation artists and the time it took us to finish that contract. So wow. that really marked the end of the era of Rocket Town because I didn't have the belief that we should keep going trying to put out independent Christian record labels underfunded and try it again. But what it did open my eyes to that whole process was you're not going to be able to replace the live event. And the live event is always going to be monetized. Well, I shouldn't say always. <laughs> it will be monetized for the near future because people gather around a common love of something. We like you know, music for us. It can be X games. It can be skateboarding. It can be church. We want to be in the same building, you know, exalting something. You know, it's, it's, I think it's Louis Giglio that says we're, we're born to worship. And even if you're not a believer, you don't understand what you're worshiping at a Nine Inch Nails concert. But it's the togetherness. It's the we're in this together. Yeah, I have a yeah. deep belief that being in the room with something and some people with common interest is really exciting. So the next six or eight years was all about that. It was all about putting on great events, putting up, producing some events, managing some events. Um, I did a global talent competition for two years for Avon Cosmetics in 148 countries. I mean, it was just like people wow. see the value in music brings people together. Um, I had met Justin Zabel, who is the CEO of Streamline, in the early 2000s when he was just starting his career as a road manager. And he road managed all of the Rocket Town tours. And I knew if the buses were leaving with Justin on them, then it's going to be a great experience. The artists love him. He's incredible with details. And Justin and I had a great relationship. Flash forward to four or five years ago, we're both sharing, you know, common workspace at an e-spaces kind of place. And we reconnect and, you know, he's just built this incredibly great event company that, you know, puts on corporate events and has a tremendous roster of clients and doing what he does well, logistics. Um, he is a very creative person, puts things together, but we started talking about what would it look like if I consulted with him on the creative side a little bit. So we worked together for three years. We kind of rebranded the company. We changed a lot of the terminology we were using. That's a big thing for me is when when words and topics start to get old, what are the new words you can use to replace them? Say the same thing, but replace them. Um, and the corporate market didn't have a lot of appeal to me, but what had appealed to me was how do you give artists a chance to communicate to these crowds? Um, so over the, la over the three years we did consulting, we did a lot of great work. And then at the beginning of this year, we both just kind of went, hey, it might be cool to just expand that role and come in and reimagine another service that we could offer through Streamline. Mm. I love that. Well, um, I know Justin really well. He was he was my uh, my neighbor when we lived in West Haven for years. That's great. So we would we would good man, great company, good leader. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit more. You touched a little bit on it, but tell us more about Streamline and what, what you do as a company. I know there's, there's definitely some, some different uh, opportunities that maybe didn't exist before through what you guys are creating. Well, um, so we branded, um, when I started with the consulting, it was Streamline Production Group. And we immediately went, if you say the word production group, your mind in the corporate market goes to setting up chairs, screens, stages, sound and lights. And Justin wanted to go much further than that. So we went through a process and rebranded it Streamline Event Agency. 
And in the music business, the word agency or agent is normally synonymous with a CAA or a William Morris or a booking agent. In the corporate world, an agency is really somebody who helps you with your messaging. It's um, Doe Anderson. It's it's the people, the big ones that have clients like Procter and Gamble, and that 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 there. It's Don Draper. You know, it's Mad Men. It's you go in and, you, and they help you with your messaging. So we like to think about we can offer lots of services, including the boring kind of ones that I just mentioned. But what we'd really like to help you with is a year out from your meeting, what is the message that you want to help communicate to your team? And how do we create a more compelling story to tell that? Part of that is uh, taking their content and helping with writing. Part of that is visuals. But then part of that is what, what we've been building, this using creativity to reinforce content. So uh, one example of that would be, if you can picture... Um, say a manufacturing company. Let's take a, let's take something that just feels kind of like a flat uh, uh, organization. And everybody knows that once a year they have to come in and they have to learn about the new product that they're going to launch, and that's required, and that's good. And 500 people can come into a convention center, and they have a schedule, and they attend three general sessions in the morning, and they have lunch, and three in the afternoon, and a cocktail party. Well, how do we break all that up to think about today's environment? One of the things that we recommend right away is everything needs to be shorter bursts of communication. So your CFO should not talk for 50 minutes because you're gonna lose everybody in 15 minutes. The goal of what we're trying to do is keep people off their phones and it's keep people engaged in what you're doing. Well, in order to do that, sometimes you need help. So we've kind of created a structure that says, hey, at the end of that general session, which might be 9 to 11.30, let Streamline take your theme of the morning and then let's bring somebody out to do something visually that stimulates the senses to reinforce that. So let's take something as generic as teamwork. Um, we're going to... We're going to get the marketing person's report. We're going to get the president's report. And then we're going to have a keynote that all are going to talk about um, uh, teamwork and how to work together inside of teams, outside of teams. Well, that's all good, but we're going to help you pick the right keynote. Uh, they're going to have some energy. They're going to have some humor. They're going to keep you going. But then 15 minutes before lunch, we will bring out um, the person that we use sometimes as a, as a magician named Justin Flom. Justin's a world-class magician. You know, he's been on every show you can think of. But Justin's a fantastic communicator, high energy, good looking. So I call him like Ryan Seacrest. You know, it's like he just, he has it all. Well, he comes out and then I will have scripted for him or we will have scripted for him some suggestions of, of the 187 tricks you know, pick three that reinforce teamwork. So it can be about trust. It can be he's got one particular thing that it sounds weird to say, especially in today's environment, but basically he'll have somebody shoot a BB into his nose and then pull it out of his eye. Well, he'll talk about how that is all trust. You are trusting this person is going to do what you say. You're going to pull the trigger at the right time. You're going to do all this. Well, obviously that blows the audience away but we've written the script that says, this is about trusting each other. So then when we get the feedback back from CEOs that are saying, our employees are remembering the points better because of what you did with creativity, that's success. So that's what now, that doesn't have to be just magic. It can be songwriting competitions. You break teams into, and you have great Nashville songwriters teach them the basics of how to do that. It can be, it can be culinary. It can be, all of these different things that you can use so long as the artist understands it's not about their show, it's about reinforcing the content. So in a time when everybody's looking for new things to do with their talents, I think we're developing a pretty good stable of things to offer. I love that. That's such a creative idea. And I, I can... I don't know. I, I think there's just a lot of good parallels that musicians can take away from this and that you constantly have to be innovating and finding ways to keep people's attention. 
Um, th- just for me personally, like I kind of honestly have a hard time going to shows because you know exactly what's coming next. Like you've right. seen it a thousand times. Like there's there's very few shows um, that I that I've been to in the last. Like some of my even favorite artists. Like I saw Lenny Kravitz last year. That was like a bucket list thing. But I'm like, man, halfway through, forty minutes into it, I'm like yawning. I'm like, how many more drum solos? And now we introduce the band, and then this part comes, and then there's a big trash can ending, and then. So I love that the the the, the takeaway is like be entertaining. Um, I think Cirque du Soleil has this thing figured out. I think you know Las Vegas has it figured out. They they know how to keep people uh, entertained, and and a lot of artists are just not good at that. They're good at well, getting up and playing their songs. I'll go a generation back. Um, you know, U2 is my Desert Island band. But I, well, I shouldn't say it this way. When I saw their Zoo TV tour in 1992, which was the most mind-blowing thing I've ever seen, then I saw they keep everything they do, they keep somebody in their team, Willie Williams, that is constantly considering how to show a show in a new way. So I've not been a fan of their music for a while, but when they decide to play the 360 tour in the round in a stadium, I want to go see what that looks like. The stage becomes part of the show. When their last one, they decide to run the length of the arena with a split screen that has elevators in it that you can see through. I'm like, I want to go see part of that. Now, some of that you could say, okay, that's just trickery because the the music's not quite as good as it used to be, but I'm also compelled by that. It means they're striving to give their audience something that's not just, here's the first three songs, here's the band introduction, here's the drum solo, here's the fire, here's the encore. You know, it's it's striving to keep your audience engaged in something else. Yeah. So I, I love that. And so obviously, you know, for the people listening to this podcast who are a lot of them may, may be working with artists or they are artists themselves striving to create um, new forms of revenue to, 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 to exploit their talents, maybe in new ways. How how are they sort of like how are musicians partnering with you guys on these type of ventures and what opportunities are there? Pretty much, it's pretty much call out for us right now. After the years I've had here and Justin's had here, we kind of have a, a go-to list of people that we know meet the criteria. Again, it's not only their talent, it also has to be their personality. But I would love to expand that list. I would love for people to reach out to us to say, hey, I, I heard what you're doing, I'm interested, can we talk about it? Because, um, I honestly need more applications. I need more than music, magic, and culinary. I need other things to be done. I mean, uh, comedy can work, but it's flat. You know, sometimes comedians do what they do. They've got us, they're great. They do what they do. They get people laughing, but I've got to have something that infuses everything together. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm wide open to pitches, to talks, and also, it's obviously, it's not all Streamline is doing. I mean, we're launching this year, we're, we're launching Streamline Creative Studio, which is developing video content for concert walls and for corporate walls, because we might not get the whole gig, but we might be excellent at creating the visuals that tell the story. So we've got creative, uh, we've got Streamline Event Agency, which is the mothership, Streamline Creative Studio, which is getting ready to come out, which is kind of visual storytelling, and then uh, Streamline Touring, which really is tour managers and and producers, just keeps the keeps the wheels running. But those wheels aren't going to be running much in 2020. So we're looking at what does that look like. We just saw um, we just saw an article that you know by the time this comes out, it might be. Uh, commonplace but you know drive-ins are starting to put on concerts stay in your car and see a show it's like okay we're gonna have to think about different ways that we can put on shows because for right now we can't get together the whole idea of a concert is being packed together 
social distancing doesn't work when we go back to that whole story I told earlier about people want to be in the room with people that love the same thing they do. That's about togetherness. That'd be really hard to replicate if you have to be in these little cubbies of six feet between people. But this idea of of a drive-in I thought was brilliant. You know, you can put your family in the minivan, roll down your windows and, you know, have 150 or a thousand cars in a parking lot in the big stage. And you can do it. It's like, wow, that people are going to get smart about this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. Um, so, and, and really just to break it down too, I, I want to, I want to get across to people. There, there is a very certain type of talent pool that you guys look for who can pull this type of entertainment off. Do you have any examples of musicians or talent that you work with? You mentioned Justin Flom works really well. Are there other examples of like people who are just absolutely nailing this thing just so we can kind of study them, we can research what are they doing, how are they communicating, how are they presenting themselves? Um, I use, uh, on the songwriting side, I, I use um, Barry Dean and Natalie Hemby a lot. Um, they are super hit songwriters. So their, you know, the schedules usually don't, uh, let them work for us a lot, but they're super, they're really good communicators. Um, uh, let's see, I was thinking of one other. Oh, um, again, it goes kind of to the magic side, but, but Harris, the third is, is unbelievable. And he runs a conference called the story conference, which is all about, the importance of storytelling in your marketing message. So he is an, I mean, I don't know Harris as well as I know Justin, but I'm getting to know Harris. What I love about his story is he kind of went from being a touring artist to being smart enough to say, what if I taught storytelling on a higher level? And now he does this annual meeting that sells out every year and it's fortune 500 CMOs that come to hear about it. So He's a great example of somebody who is 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 exceeding that uh, that level of communication beyond just his craft. But I also think there's a lot of people that are working towards it. I get more calls from artists. I mean, l- you know, in Nashville we have a great station, Lightning 100. I get Lightning 100 artists calling, t- and by the time I finish talking with them, I realize you know they don't have they don't have that that connection to the content that I need. They might be a cooler name or a higher, they might be on the charts, but they just want to play their set. And there's a big difference between playing your set and being an entrepreneur. Mm. So the list, so because it's a new idea, the list is pretty small. Um, but the ones who are really good at it are chefs because of the Food Network because they've had to learn how to be good communicators and they've had to learn how to be clever. You know, the Chip and Joanna Gaines are, you know, they're outside of our ability to get them. But, but that reality TV thing when done right, especially on HGTV or Cooking Network or things, those are people that have had to learn to communicate to people well, something that's a pretty high level craft. And that's what I'm looking for. Well, I love that. That's a great quote. And I just, I just wrote that down. There's a big difference between playing your set and being an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. What do you mean when you say that? Cause I, I just, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Well, um, you talked earlier about your meeting with John Andrade and RKT records. I remember right about that time, um, right about that time was when we, and, and you mentioned MySpace. we started, we started making a measurable, how many, people do they have following them on MySpace? The shift went from Chris Rice had no audience other than people that knew him at camps. He started at zero, but he had music that moved people fast. In between the time of 1997 and 2005, a lot of the responsibility of building your artist move, building your career moved to the artist. And we got to a point, and again, I haven't been in the label game for 10 years. I would assume that this is still the case. But now the artist has to bring the audience to the label who can then take them to another level. That was never the case. The case was always about the music. The case was always about the, 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 is this going to compel people to buy a CD? 
Now it's, can I pour some special sauce on somebody who already has a big following? I have, um, I have a close, uh, I, I have a neighbor, uh, again, in Chris Caraba, who has a band dashboard confessional. And I met Chris at a bus stop dropping our kids off. Um, I didn't know dashboard that well. I knew the name, but, um, when I went and saw him at the exit in or the Ryman or somewhere, I remember being so inspired by the 35 to 45 year old people in ball caps with beard. Like they were living, Chris broke, he was the emo guy. He broke in the early two thousands and became this torch bearer for tortured kids. <laughs> well, now those tortured kids have a minivan and three kids and all that, but they still go to sing every word of every song at the top of their lungs. Chris is one of the most soft-spoken, introspective, quiet people I know. So Chris's leadership is really more about how he tapped into people's heart story. So I look at him as a serious entrepreneur. I would not put him in the situation that I'm talking about in the corporate environment because he doesn't have that flom mentality. So it looks different for different people all the time. But what's going to work best in the corporate side is the bigger personalities. You know, the more bombastic they are, the better when it's authentic. So it uh, the the we all know now that musicians and artists need to be the CEO. They need to be the entrepreneur, but there's a difference between being it and saying that you're it. Yeah, that's man. That is so good. One, honestly, one of the best little minute sound bites I think we've had in our podcast history. So thank you for sharing that. That's such good. Can I quote you on that? I will quote, you can quote me on that. Um, I just think that's you. You hit it, hit the nail on the head. So many people who break into the music industry do not realize that that the artist has to bring the audience and the music, not just the not just the music anymore. And so, really, what a lot of people's focus on, and it's it's hard. It's really hard. That's why there's so few people who succeed at it because you not only have to be a great communicator, you also have to write amazing songs. And then be able to deliver those songs live and, and tell the story. And, and like you said, be, be a leader and tap into people's heart story. So, um, Well, it's easier yeah. than ever to get your music out there. But the filter system is much harder to get it exposed. Like um, I, I saw somewhere recently, <clears throat> I forget where it was, but I saw a series of kids... My daughter is graduating college tomorrow, but she's not going to have a ceremony. And, you know, the campus is closed. And so we're having a party here at the house. But I watched something the other night was these graduates of 2020 that are kind of got shafted here this last quarter of the year through COVID. Yeah, that's but, so terrible. I can't even imagine. But what I was uh, unbelievably impressed by is eight kids out of 10 who go on camera and talk are pretty good. They've grown up doing this. You know, it that's different too. They know how to say the words. They know how to look at the camera way better than I do. They, they know it's, they were raised on American Idol. They're raised on, let's go to commercial. They're raised on all of that. So, but if they don't have the, the stuff behind it, it's only half the equation. So they're way better at being natural at promoting, but they have to promote something great. So you make a good point that both have to arrive at the same time. And when it happens, it, that's pretty magic. And that's what we're looking for. Yeah. So good. A um, couple more questions and then we'll jump into our lightning round. What is the uh, business model for companies that hire you? Is it just like they, they pay you a fee or percentage of, you know, ticket sales or how do they, how do they kind of engage with you? Well, with Streamline, basically what we are looking for is companies that are putting on high-end conferences and they will have a budget that they come to us with and say, we have X to spend, here are the services that we can do, and then we will negotiate all of that. Um, so 
if we put in a line item that says we need X amount of money for talent, then it's up to me to manage that number to where we're paying the talent something, Streamline's making something, we're writing the script, we're working collaboratively with the artists. So the business model is, is really more traditional on the corporate meeting side, like, you know, it, it, most big companies have annual gatherings. Some are huge, some are thousands of people, some are 50 people. We're working much more on the large scale and that's just a part of a big company's annual budget. We have a, a great client, uh, Carrier Air Conditioning, and they do four or five events a year because they do regional things, they do award shows. And then we're always thinking about, again, if you go back to, we want Streamline to be set apart by its production value. We want people to say that meeting looked and felt different than the others. So the business model really is we are hunting for companies that want to up the representation of their live events. I love it. So how can musicians get involved and in, in to, uh, to be a part of what you're doing? Well, I mean, part of it is just is, is again, bringing something new to the table that we notice. Um, I'm looking for things all the time. I mean, some, sometimes I just get a request that says I have, X budget and I need X 75 minutes of music done. Don't care about the content. Don't just, I need entertainment for my party. Well, I've got 300 people on a list that I can call and do that. What I'm looking for really is who are the people that can help connect us to the whole story better. And um, it's getting the word out through things like this. That's why I wanted to talk with you about it because I want people to know in a time when things are drying up and fees are going down, this is, you know, it's, it, 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 you're not going to retire off of this, but you're going to be seen in front of a lot more people that would probably never have bought a ticket to your concert or downloaded your music. But you're going to, pro if you're good at what you do, 2,000 people will go back to various parts of the country talking about what they learned from you. So good. So is there, is there an avenue that people can, can make submissions? Well, streamlineeventagency.com is fine to start there. Okay. Um, my contact information is on that page. Um, they can certainly email me directly on that. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to deal with people. I think, I think you and I have covered pretty clearly what I'm looking for. Yes. So if you're a, a small independent bluegrass band looking for gigs, uh, uh, that's not going to resonate. But if you are an artist that's going, gosh, I've got 10 years of this, I'm looking for something else. I mean, we just had a major, well, I probably shouldn't say, a major university in the state of Texas reach out to us and say, we want to celebrate our nursing school because the nurses who are graduating are basically going straight into the field to help with this pandemic. So we want to have a system-wide party for them and we want music to be part of that. Well, I then go on my grid, my Excel grid that says, okay, here's how much Brad Paisley is to do a concert. And here's how much Brad Paisley is to do a private concert. And here's how much Brad Paisley is to do a corporate concert. And I had to start a new column that says virtual. So it's like, I'm calling agents and we're just laughing at each other going, well, how do you price this? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just using Brad as an example. I haven't talked to Brad's agent or anything, but we're asking him to sit on his couch and do 40 minutes. That's different than his four trucks have to run and his band and all that. So everything's kind of changing in the way all this works, but it's another opportunity. Depending on when we all start going back, We've got to figure out ways to communicate the power of entertainment through these screens in the most compelling way possible. And that's another thing we're working on by launching a pretty robust network that will hopefully have that interactivity. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm off topic, but I'll tell one more quick story. Caraba Dashboard did a show the other night and it was called As Social As We Can Get, which was a great name. And 
for a half hour before he played, they show little videos and they had a great chat room running down the side. Well, he has such a rabid fan base that there were 5,000 people responding to everything that was going on in the videos. And it was so cool to see people's favorite moments. I remember I was there, I was this. And then when he did his concert, which was just in his basement, same thing. As soon as he hits a chord, 80 people are saying, oh, I can't believe he's playing this. It's like, that's, that's as interactive as we can get right now. But it was super cool because of the incredible fan base he's built. Mm. I love it. Fan base. That's the, that's it. <laughs> that's the key. Go build a fan base. So, um, are you ready for our lightning round as we're closing out today? Scared to death of this, but go ahead. All right. What was the first concert you attended? Steve Martin. <laughs> but he played a 12,000 seat. He played the same room that I had Michael W. Smith in at the University of Missouri, and it was hysterical. You know, he's an incredible musician, hysterical comedy. I was in seventh grade. I took a date. My parents dropped us off, and they picked us up, and my date wet her pants. <laughs> That's why I will never forget my first concert. <laughs> I, he was pretty funny. That's a, that's a hard one to uh, to, to top. <laughs> yeah, we what didn't have a second date, by the way. Didn't have that. That that was the end of that. <laughs> uh, what was your favorite subject in school, and why? Humanities, um, because I had an amazing teacher named Conrad Stosky. And he looked exactly like his name says. He looked like Einstein. It, I'm sure he was probably in his 60s, but he seemed to be in his 90s. White hair everywhere, black rim glasses. And he taught us about architecture and art and light. And uh, he taught me a phrase that I love to use that hardly anybody knows called chiaroscuro. And chiaroscuro is how light and dark work off of each other. And... I think that's maybe one of the first times I woke up to artistic endeavor. So uh, humanity is my junior year of high school. I love it. What is the best road trip you've ever been on? I mean, probably when, so we had our four biological kids in four and a half years. So those were closely packed. Probably when they were between 10 and six, we decided to drive to Colorado to go skiing. Uh, probably a big mistake, but um, th those are the memories you make. They were they were killing us along the way, but by the time we got there, we had a blast. The ski trip was a blast, and, the, and everything about it was fun. So making memories with the family, doing something like that was great. Now, I'll cheat and say my boys, who are now 24 and 22, when they were 18 and 20, they – they took their bikes to and flew to London, uh, assembled their bikes at Gatwick Airport and rode their bikes to Paris. <laughs> so they took two months to get to, you know, all around Europe and Scotland and they went everywhere and or sorry, all across England and Scotland and Netherlands and then landed uh, in Paris in time for my son to take his uh, college art class at the at the Louvre. So that that's that's an epic road trip. That that is epic. What was the first concert you worked on professionally? Michael W. Smith Big Picture Tour, the Hearn Center, Columbia, Missouri, April of 1987. I love it. And lastly, is there a documentary or book that really changed the way you thought about something? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I got to pass on that. I've got, there's one that I watched about two years ago and I'm not going to remember the name of it. It was on an obscure network, but it was on a female concert set designer that everyone uses Gaga, you know, everyone. And it was the methodology of how she builds everything from clay models to what you see 
opened so many synapses to me to the thing we started talking about is what is it that makes something different? And I, I forget her name. I believe she was French, but I sent it around to everyone I knew immediately and went, this is another level. So I'll email you that later and maybe we can voice me over and make me sound smarter than that answer. <laughs> no, that's good. I, I love that. So I, I was, I was, I was, um, I was glad that you, that you didn't say, uh, Joe exotic. So that might have I been. did my very best to get through Joe Exotic because my kids told me I should, but I, I wouldn't mind having that eight hours back or whatever it was. <laughs> Unbelievable. Through, 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 through quarantine, though, we have definitely found some things. But last night, we watched the new Seinfeld episode on Netflix, and I forgot through this time, we're, I don't know, two months into quarantine. I haven't laughed that hard in months. And I forgot about what laughter does for everything about your spirit. You know, the endorphins, everything about it. My wife and I were literally doubled over in tears. And so laughter is a very important thing. <laughs> I think we, um, I actually didn't know that, that that came out. Is it is it a new season or just a, just an episode? It's one show from the Beacon Theater and I think it came out this week. Okay, so it's a stand-up. It's called Twenty Three Hours or Twenty Three Hours to Go. Okay, because the the joke about comics is they work one hour a day. <laughs> right. Well, that I was. I'll I'll second that. I actually took my wife to to the Beacon Theater to see Seinfeld live a couple of years ago. Ah. Uh, we were sitting right like under his nostrils, front seat, uh, dead center, in the middle. Uh, I've never laughed as hard in my life, so I can very like much that. second that. Not not to. Sidebar, but we did take our son who just moved to New York to see KC Musgraves at the Beacon last year, and that was one of the best shows I've seen. Such a so. great, such a great theater, and, and yeah, KC puts on a great show. Great show, great writer. I love writing, and lyrics are the most important thing in the world to me, and she captures it really well. And Natalie Hemby, who I referred to earlier, writes a lot of hers. Yeah, she's a big, big writer with with KC. Awesome. Well, Don, thank you so much for being on today. We are going to do our deep dive today on the digital space and how it's going to exist regardless of what happens with COVID and how there's so much opportunity there. So if people want to hear that, to learn from that, they can go to madeitinmusic.com, madeitinmusic.com, and just sign up for the deep dives. You'll have access to that. So Don, thanks so much again for being on the show today. So thank you. I really enjoyed it. Great conversation. What's up? Thank you for watching the Made It in Music Podcast Season 3. If you want to check out any of the other episodes from Season 3, click up here. And we talk in the show about these really cool deep dives with all this extra bonus content. If you want access to all of those, click here. <laughs>